Welcome to Wellspring on the Air. I'm Lindsay Steffen, a therapist at Wellspring and the host of today's show about social anxiety. So we are here with one of our therapists, Chris. He's been with us for a while now and has been on the show with me many times. So we're happy to have him here today to discuss this interesting topic and also a topic that's important. I think some people don't even recognize that they have social anxiety or know um, you know, maybe someone, your child or someone you work with, you don't realize, oh, some of these traits coming out are actually, it's a specific disorder and there's a, a cause and treatment. So we're going to learn all about that today. So thank you for being here today, Chris. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Lindsay. It's always a pleasure to uh, join in on the show. So let's just start with defining social anxiety. So what is it? Um, some people might just think, oh, they're just shy. So let's kind of yeah. talk about the differences there too. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think you, I, you bring up a great point. Social anxiety, uh, sometimes also known as social phobia, is exactly that. It's in the family of anxiety where there's an extreme or intense feeling of fear or feeling that um, there is some, that something goes wrong if I go to social gatherings, if I interact with a person, even just simply as talking to someone over Zoom or phone call, it is not uh, necessarily something that's within their control. And so those we would um, view more as a, a disorder rather than just shyness. And certainly there's a lot of physiological overlap, but we'll get into that in a, in a little bit more, but just know that social anxiety disorder is a um, a serious disorder in the mental health and uh, just needs to be treated for. Okay, so maybe um, just go into a little bit, I guess, of the symptomology. What might we notice if we or someone we love is struggling with social anxiety? What does it look like? Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the first thing that we want, want to know is how much it interferes with your daily functioning and how it impacts your school or work or uh, just even um, gatherings with family members where we want to know if a person is wanting to. So there's the, the difference between shyness and then a social anxiety is that these individuals are wanting this social interaction. It is one of our basic needs such as food, water, um, we are social beings as humans, right? And they are wanting these connections and wanting to bring themselves to connect with others, but it's just this debilitating fear and un unexplained thoughts that come to mind. Um, they may experience things such as blushing, nausea, mm -hmm. excessive sweating, trembling, just dizziness. And you can imagine when you're ex experiencing these symptoms, you don't feel like wanting to talk or be a, a vulv or uh, just stay in that situation, right? Right, you wanna run, your alarm bells are going off. Yeah, your body's kind of freaking out. I mean, internally, like mm -hmm. you were saying, they have thoughts. A lot of my clients, I know they have thoughts like, um, they're looking at me weird, they're judging me, a mm -hmm. lot of critical self-talk that yeah. a lot of the time is not even rational. You know, no one is thinking anything, but right. that's it's like a obsession with, oh my gosh, I'm being perceived as, weird or dumb or whatever the negative label is. Absolutely. And that's a key point there too. The individuals who have social anxiety understand that their thoughts are irrational, understand that uh, a lot of these symptoms uh, don't make sense because there's no real threat, but it's not that they can't help it by over trying to think through or push through. And some of them actually do try their best to push through it. It's just, it's there and it's very real for them. Mm. Okay. So how does it develop? Where does social anxiety really come from or originate? And this is a question that up until now, there's no one-to-one -one cause, but there's certainly a lot of factors that researchers have found. Um, it's part biological, part environmental. Uh, people who have various uh, anxiety disorder in the family or in their family of origin may develop a social anxiety and certainly their environment, how they grow up, their interactions, if they were any experience any trauma or maybe some um, very critical uh, parenting or teachers, mm. they grow up with this sense of hypervigilance to uh, nonverbals and the tone and just body language and um, 
we believe that we hypothesize that these individuals are very careful not to upset a certain person. So they develop these uh, awareness about uh, the smallest uh, inkling and oftentimes it touches on their um, fight or flight mode. Mm, interesting. Yeah. So I kind of hear even that trauma response, like being hyper vigilant or overly aware. Mm -hmm. So then if you bring that into a normal social setting, though, where there's not danger or something bad going to happen. It's almost like they're picking up on every little body movement and language and kind of interpreting it as mm -hmm. meaning something when likely it's just neutral stimuli, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, absolutely. As you get to more interaction, perhaps you would experience the variety that uh, we may have disagreements or we may have difference of ideas. And typically we can um, make sense of it, right? We can think through it and not experience uh, any type of negative um, feelings or thoughts about it. But for a person with social anxiety, it may be uh, just small conversations can be experienced as an extreme rejection or judgment, as you mentioned before. So it's, okay. it's difficult. Yeah. I'm curious, people might have this question and uh, I've explored it with clients too, but when you have social anxiety, do you have it in all settings or at all times or can it be just specific settings? So more so we see this as a, a generalized, um, air, it covers in general areas. So it's often when it involves interacting with people, just anyone. It could be a close family member, it could be an acquaintance or a stranger. Even the thoughts of just needing to interact with someone can bring about those uh, symptoms or those uh, feelings. Okay, gotcha. And I've seen in my work clinically, I see a correlation with depression, which might yes. be obvious to us. But yeah, I do. I see those clients who, like you're saying earlier, they want to be social. They want to interact and connect. It's a normal human need and desire. But doing that takes so much out of them, takes so much of you. If they're in therapy, using their coping skills, their self-talk, that it's really exhausting and can mm -hmm. be discouraging. So maybe eventually it's just they start to develop depression about how hard it is. And that high level of anxiety eventually kind of shuts them down. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. yeah, absolutely. The sense that, oh, these interactions are um, creating such um, anxiety the typical, I guess, um, reaction is to avoid. And so you find yourself more isolated. That's another uh, related to depression. Um, the other factor that we can often see is from people being told uh, that they're shy, that they just need to get over it. So it just feeds on their uh, negative self-talk in that manner. So yeah, it, it really does tie in strongly with depression. Yeah. And I think I notice with, I do work with social anxiety and I see my clients, it's very distressing if they have, like you said, the physiological symptoms. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I have a client who maybe sweats profusely. And so people mm -hmm. see that or blushing that's right on your face. You can't hide it. Mm -hmm. And so I start to get clients who are maybe actually getting better, but then because their body still has that response, they're embarrassed or almost anxious about being anxious and then yes. getting embarrassed and showing those signs. Any mm -hmm. thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. And those are some visible signs, right? That um, in their mind, wow, they're very self-conscious in those moments and wanting to avoid any more social interaction, even more social interaction. And it's difficult position to be in um, because unfortunately people do look and observe and make a, a draw a conclusion, whether correct or not. I think um, what may be helpful is be open to talking, and I know this is difficult, but be open to talking about it, that it, I have um, I have a social anxiety, and this is the importance of having a proper diagnosis and treatment that comes along, and I'm working on through it. That'll be more helpful. People um, are more understanding when you allow them to know that this is not something that uh, it's under my control per se, or, but that I'm working on it and just invite you to, um, you know, seek help, seek mental health counseling, seek any type of counseling to um, help reduce the thoughts, which can lead to also um, better um, way of 
interacting with people. Yeah. And we'll get to more of that in the second half of our show. So this first half, we're just kind of defining it, talking through it, the ins and outs, and then, but definitely stay tuned and join for the second half. Cause we're going to talk about if we don't treat it, what are some of the negative consequences and then what are solutions? So we come with kind of the negative first, but then we bring the hope of what you can do about it. So if you're listening and relating to this show, definitely don't feel hopeless because there are solutions, there are treatment options. And so it's definitely something that you don't have to just live with the high distress levels that you might be now. So, so far today we have defined social anxiety, um, we differentiated how it's different than shyness. A lot of people will confuse those two, but social anxiety is actually a diagnosable mental health disorder. So there are origins for um, social anxiety. There's specific symptoms and specific treatment for it. So we want to educate our listeners on that. If you joined us late, go to your favorite podcast channel, Wellspring on the Air, and you can catch up and hear the first half of the show that we've had with Chris so far. So, well, thanks, Chris, for being here again. Um, we are going to dive right back in. So what are some negative consequences if we don't treat social anxiety or if it's never diagnosed and someone's just suffering with it? What can mm -hmm. happen? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are a lot of um, things we do worry for a person who live with this social anxiety and don't have a specific treatment for it or don't even recognize it. Some of the more um, some of the more negative consequences we talked about can lead to depression, lead to further isolation. Um, but the more severe ones, over time, as they are feel that the anxiety is out of control or the feelings out of control, they may resort to substance use, alcohol, drugs to kind of numb the feelings or, and try to live throughout the day. Uh, thoughts of suicide is in the most extreme cases that we find um, linked to untreated social anxiety disorder. And of course, further uh, isolation, job loss, or uh, not being able to keep up with school, which impedes development. Um, and those are some of the long list of consequences that may happen if uh, this is un left untreated. Yeah, I hear the possibility of a spiral effect. So I can't attend classes because I'm so anxious socially. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not passing my classes. Now I'm not on the career path I want. So yeah, I mean, how depressing that it kind of feels like social anxiety could really steal your life, steal your future if you just leave it to its own devices, really. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, what let's talk a little bit. So there's, there's definitely a lot of negative consequences. And um, we want to give our listeners also those some hope. So let's talk about if we notice we're listening and we think, wow, I do have social anxiety that this sounds like me, or maybe we're thinking of our, our kids. Maybe we're a teacher. We're noticing mm -hmm. at school. Oh, you know, so-and-so this fits. Um, what can we do? What are, what are solutions to social anxiety? Absolutely. Catching it early is one of the best way of uh, just getting help. And we want the person who is experiencing social anxiety first to have the words for it, that this is what I'm feeling. And this is uh, related to an irrational type of thinking or uh, emotions that come about. So recognizing the triggers even that causes you to start feeling the nervousness or feeling out of control. And then when that happens, we can start practicing things that we often teach our clients, right? Relaxation, deep breathing, mindfulness, grounding. Uh, in certain circumstances, we do uh, ask them to get a psychiatric evaluation. Perhaps some medication will help control it so that they can practice and focus and able to um, fulfill their uh, work responsibilities or school responsibilities. Uh, having a support group is also a wonderful uh, method, just knowing that there are others out there wanting to listen to you, giving you um, the positive regard that will be knowing that interactions that you can practice the interactions and know uh, to challenge those thoughts or more so know that it feels safe to be around others who want to understand you and want to see you get better. I think those are some um, strong 
uh, major uh, methods to help and treat it right away. And the one thing I do know that is um, helpful to know is that you are not not alone in this. Right. This social anxiety is about um, affects millions of Americans adults and we don't even have the statistics for children yet so yeah. yeah these are some of the methods that will be helpful yeah i was looking and i saw there's more than 200,000 cases in the u.s per year and that's at least just diagnosed so i mean if you imagine how many people don't know they have it don't seek treatment think they're just shy or think oh something's wrong with me so but that's yeah, it's prevalent. And I think among social anxiety disorders, it's one of the higher ones statistically. So it's incredible. And I do, I see it in clients as young as, you know, eight, nine, 10, you start to see some of those symptoms develop. And so definitely, like you're saying, early treatment is so important because you can actually route away from really big consequences in life. So I do, I see you were talking about substance abuse. And I think here in the US, um, I can't speak to other countries, but I think here kind of social drinking um, is something that's pretty normalized in a lot of circles. But I do see some of my clients who have actually developed some alcohol um, abuse tendencies because they need those drinks once they're in the social setting. And so there starts to be this correlation of, Oh, we're, we're going to dinner. Or we're going out with friends. I, you know, let's have a drink before let's have some mm -hmm. drinks while we're there. And so they feel like they can't interact without that crutch. And that actually that's detrimental because then their, their confidence is going down, down, down. And they feel like I can't be in social settings without alcohol. Yeah. Absolutely. Just the thought, right? Preparing yourself. And it's such an easy uh, fix too, because you have that, it has an immediate quote unquote positive effect because you're no longer feeling those symptoms, but that doesn't mean that you've addressed it. It's only a momentary thing, but it becomes such a reliance on it because it felt good the first time and the second time. Exactly. Um, and it's, it's not, um, what happens, you know, when you're confronted with situations that you didn't anticipate for. And those are yeah. some things that we encourage you to consider um, finding help for. And so that you can properly, um, you know, be more yourself, be more free and not have to rely on um, any substances to live a fuller life. Yeah, that's great. I'm curious, just for maybe someone who's listening and is relating, we talked about medication and that I've seen for many of my clients, it's been a big help specifically with a social anxiety diagnosis, but mm -hmm. just on the therapy side, what are maybe some therapies or techniques, some things that they might learn in counseling mm -hmm. that would be a part of that treatment plan? Absolutely. <clears throat> so we talked about um, becoming aware. So um, part of the uh, some of the work that I've tried to do is to uh, to attach sensations, bodily sensations, to our thoughts and to our um, emotions by just giving that language and words. Um, we can begin noticing when things are causing the anxiety and when what other uh, things we can do, such as imagery, something that. I've tried uh, having them picture some calm, safe place. Uh, we have um, a tapping that we frequently use in EMDR work as well. And um, certainly thought tracking is a fantastic um, method of knowing where, when, what situations and how we can uh, find alternative thoughts, bring more options and also just connecting with people. Um, we have groups here at Wellspring that deal specifically with anxiety. And so social anxiety is uh, more than welcome to be in that group. As we mentioned, that's the support we give one another to talk through their uh, struggles, challenges, but also give each other's encouragement and solutions on um, their own specific situations. Yeah, that's great. I even just think of the psychoeducation piece of therapy. Uh, people might be surprised to hear this or maybe not, but mm -hmm. I actually feel like a lot of my therapy time with not just adolescents, but even young adults and maybe uh, average age adults is actually teaching social skills. Mm 
Mm-hmm. So it's kind of interesting. We think, oh, you, you grow up and you know how to talk to people. But if we weren't raised in a home that had, you know, healthy communication or really fostered that connected piece with others and kind of those interpersonal interactions, we might not even know what is normal conversation. How do I start a conversation? Mm-hmm. I teach my clients, you know, asking questions. You notice, oh, they're wearing a band shirt. You can, oh, is that your favorite band? Have you seen them in concert? Things that for some of us seem very natural and easy, but other people were teaching this in session. They think, wow, I would have never thought of that. So maybe noticing if you might actually have a deficit in some social skills, but that's okay because that's totally fixable. It's just like learning to ride a bike. It's a skill you have to learn and you can actually learn how to be more engaging socially as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just knowing that uh, this skill is something that you can learn and acquire is helpful and gives hope, right? That we are um, able to develop it in within ourselves, no matter how old we are and understanding how our background and environment or maybe within our family for one reason or another didn't help us develop those skills. Um, As we're talking, there's one uh, method that I'm also curious about is knowing how other people may be experiencing. So that gives you the word to know like, oh, this is some experience that I'm having. So looking at blogs, social anxiety blogs, um, there are a couple of good writers out there that are able to creatively write um, what they go through and how they work through it. And so even just um, reading about other people's um, challenges and how they overcome it has been something that might be helpful for especially our younger crowds who don't know where to start, who to ask. Yes, I love that. I think it's true. And our younger people, they do love to read blogs and kind of have that the social media following others who maybe struggle with that and seeing their ups and downs, seeing their good and bad days, what works for them. So that can be encouraging to see someone with the same disorder you struggle with, but actually managing it well and successfully and knowing that's absolutely a possibility for you too. Yes, absolutely. I noticed in research that it's actually the prevalence is higher among females within yes. adolescents and adults. And I guess we don't really know why that is necessarily, but that's just an interesting fact. Mm-hmm. We, in, you're right. Do, well, there's no, or at least in, in my uh, research, um, kind of like for this topic, that didn't come up as like what the causes for the difference, but we can certainly, um, hypothesize to speculate the social interaction is something that I, I, I think is stronger it, um, in, in maybe our, in the female or females because they do enjoy that connection aspect and uh, the human connection. So they find themselves in more situations where they would like to be part of a group, part of a um, discussion. And um, perhaps that gives them more awareness or attunement to reading people, reading uh, facial expression, reading tone. And just that makes sense. More of that intuitive factor, maybe Mm. that could be more natural to some females. We don't want to stereotype, but I know a lot of my guy friends, they'll go and play soccer and they're like, yeah, Mm. we hung out. It was a great time. (laughs) And, but like, you didn't talk, you just played. They're like, yeah, it was great. (laughs) But maybe sometimes women, not always, but yeah, you want to sit down. How's it going? How's work? Dive Mm. into all the nitty gritty. So I can see what you're saying with that. We will see a more increase in male, especially boys with the, uh, increase in social media and social aspects of uh, video game streaming. They do enjoy the chat aspect, but oh, yeah. um, that's another area that certainly can be both good and bad for social development, social skill development. Okay. Well, very good, Chris. Well, that brings us to the end of our time today. So thank you again for coming. As always, we love to learn from you. And I know you're an expert on this topic. So Um, If anyone missed the first half of the show or you came in kind of midway, go ahead and go to Wellspring on the Air, the channel on the podcast app, or you can go to our blog, wellspringmiami.org, and you can look up the title of today's show by Chris. It was on social anxiety. Um, We also, we love to hear from you. So encourage us, let us know you're listening, send comments, questions to on the air at wellspringmiami.org. 
So again, thank you, Chris. Any closing comments or anything? Are we ready to sign off? Well, thank you so much for inviting me. This has been a helpful uh, topic, even for myself to kind of uh, refresh on the things. We hope that all of you are now more able to recognize and find help. Just even be curious about it and just ask your healthcare provider, hey, do I need more additional uh, help or uh, is this within the normal range? Uh, we are more than uh, ready to help you uh, sort those things out. Absolutely. Yes, there are resources. You're not alone with this. So very good. All right. Well, it's time to wrap up. This is Lindsay Steffen with Wellspring on the Air because hearts and minds matter.